Hello, my name is Chris Bowen. I'm an MRI physicist with the Biotic Medical Imaging Research Group. I'm located in the QE2 Halifax Infirmary with my office near the 3T MRI site. Today, I'd like to talk to you about MRI quality control, the role QC plays, as well as the role of imaging protocoling uh, for better clinical MRI. I'm gonna describe for you a MRI QC program that I started about two years ago and that is now in place at the 10 MRI sites across the province. Uh, so, first of all, which of the following two conversations is most familiar? Effectively, does quality control you or do you control quality? Uh, the former conversation is where uh, proactively a uh, quality control technician has identified issues and has conversations with an MR tech. So, like, have you noticed an issue, low signal strength in a particular RF coil? Whereas the latter, unfortunately, is often the case more commonly where you have an MR tech who is actually uh, doing clinical work and is identifying issues either to a QC tech or the vendor. So it's basically the goal of any quality control program to try to have more of the former and less of the latter. Well, in reality, you'll always have some of both. So why should I control quality? Uh, well, effectively, it's because you have to. Uh, the American College of Radiology requires a series of measurements that happen either weekly or on a yearly basis for a site to be accredited. Now in the US, this has teeth. It has force of law by the 2008 uh, Medicare Improvement for Patients Act. So it's required and sites cannot bill Medicare uh, if they do not have this accreditation. So in Canada, it's a softer requirement. It's a recommendation by the CAR that they follow the ACR guidelines. Um, but it is also the case that most Canadian hospitals have to satisfy what's called Standard 16. They go through these Accreditation Canada surveys every few years. And part of that requires that they have documented QC protocols for all DI equipment. And hospitals are regularly audited uh, to enforce this compliance. So a question I frequently get is, why is it that the MRI vendors don't ensure quality? You have a service contract, you're paying GE or Siemens to make sure not only that the equipment was delivered in good fashion, but that it is maintained in good fashion. So why is quality not their problem? And the difference really boils down to understanding the difference between preventative maintenance and quality control. So the responsibility of the vendors is to ensure quality assurance. What this means is that in general, of their thousands of MRIs, they all have good processes such that you can expect them to behave well over time in general. So this would include uh, preventative maintenance as a very important component of this, where at regular intervals, usually quarterly or less frequently, the vendor will come in and check things like water filters, make table adjustments, perform uh, system calibrations to make sure that in general, the MRIs are behaving well. So this differs from quality control where measurements are both more frequent because you can't go semi-annual before you discover a problem. And also that you are detecting any issues specific to individual MRIs that may be coming up rather than in general, all MRIs, which is the responsibility of the vendor. So that's really one of the main differences and it's best way to understand the relationship between what the vendors are responsible for and what the hospitals are responsible for. So where does quality come from? Well, there are five basic stages and every one of those is important for overall determining how well your system is gonna operate. The first one, and I treat these in time order uh, for which they happen, is the actual RFP or request for proposal. This is uh, basically not which vendor, is it Siemens or GE or Philips, it's, it's more specific. It's like what kind of RF coils? Do we need uh, 32 channel head coils? Do we need flex coils? Do we need cardiac software? Uh, do we need liver elastography? It's sort of the entire comprehensive selection of what components and how we're going to actually evaluate and rate those components to, to come up with an overall winner, essentially, of, of the RFP request. So that determines which system and how it's configured that you receive. Uh, the second component is the acceptance. So that's basically, was the MRI delivered as specified? Did you get all the parts? Are they all working? Are the calibrations correct? Uh, the third part, uh, which is gonna be the focus of what I discussed today, is MRI QC. So that's basically a trending action. Uh, is this MRI just as good as it was either last week or last year, depending on the frequency of the tests you're doing? 
And I'm going to focus a lot on that today. Uh, and it is important. And it's one of the layers uh, that's required to ensure quality of your system. Uh, the fourth is probably the most frequent source of problems. It's MRI protocoling. So even if your system is working well, there's no hardware or software failures, uh, do I have the correct scan parameters? Have I got too much resolution? Am I uh, using breath hold instructions correctly, patient positioning appropriately? Uh, there's a lot of things that go into MRI protocoling and the technologists have a, have a huge role in ensuring that this happens and that it's done correctly. Uh, finally, the last aspect that's important for quality is the radiologist performance. And the ACR actually has specifications required to ensure the radiologist performance is adequate. They require double reads with mutual agreement for uh, evaluation where you look at summary statistics both for individual radiologists like some specific doctor but also groups like does one particular group for example like a Halifax MSK rad relative to other MSK groups are they both performing with um, mutual agreement statistics appropriately. So this is common in the US and is, uh, I would say, in its infancy in Canada, but it's developing. So all of these five components are important and they frequently uh, create quality that is ascribed to the wrong category. So people think it's say QC or they bought the wrong machine when in reality it's protocoling uh, or you accepted the wrong equipment. So I'm going to focus on MRI QC and protocoling. So I'm going to describe an MRI QC and acceptance program that is now in place for all of the 10 MRIs across the province. And I'm going to indicate some of the sort of results that we have been finding so far in the program. Slides. So first of all, what tests does the ACR require and how often do they require them? They basically fall into two categories, weekly and annual. The weekly ones basically are measurements on an ACR phantom and every one of the 10 public MRIs in Nova Scotia has one of these and in fact many of you have probably done the weekly QC measurements uh, on your scanners. So essentially these produce a number of and you can see the types of tests that are done in the checklist up ahead. The ACR is actually quite an old standard from the 90s and some things are essentially uh, out of date. For example, uh, film printer quality is long since passed, so we don't really do that test anymore. So there's often the opportunity, uh, as we have in our program in Nova Scotia, of adding more modern tests to more stringently evaluate uh, subtle variations that are important for a modern scanner. So we have the base Q ACR tests as well as some additional ones. So these tests uh, are added somewhat based on modernization of the ACR standard and also if there's any specific applications like spectroscopy or functional MRI that have a particularly stringent requirement on a particular system then we can do QC for that as well. Now the ACR does not require daily QC and we in general do not do that across the province. Some sites do somewhat have a daily QC program. Um, it would basically be a simple five minute signal to noise ratio protocol, basically a head coil and a spherical phantom. It's recommended by the ACR if feasible, but uh, it's not required. Uh, vendors often have a QC test you can see from the service browser uh, that can be run by the local site where it can show trending and other aspects. So if you wish to do it, it is in the service desktop of your MR systems. So on to the next category is what is the ACR phantom? Uh, it's a, in every one of your MRI sites uh, across the province and you can see it's a collection of structures inside of a doped uh, basically paramagnetic salts phantom to shorten T1 and T2. It's got a variety of structures, grids, uh, wedges that are precision uh, sized so that we can evaluate whether there are any issues with distortion, with um, sensitivity, signal to noise, various things that may show degradation of performance in your scanner. So how do I perform the ACR scan? Many of you perhaps have done this and you're familiar with it as there is a ACR uh, weekly QC protocol on each of your scanners in Nova Scotia. Uh, the ACR recommends when possible a single person perform QC if workflow permits. This is essentially intended to try to have consistency from one week to the next. 
Uh, when that's not feasible, and it's often not feasible uh, from either, uh, certainly in city where we have, I think, 16 techs uh, rotating through three magnets, but, but even in rural sites, there are multiple Q techs who often perform QC. And so we rely on the latter, essentially having good instructions and positioners so that we have a very consistent uh, process where we acquire the data. So you can see the label for the 3T, which uh, describes the coil to use any positioning or pads. It involves a, a non-magnetic level, and it's very important to have both left, right, and SI leveling. And you can see how that uh, is indicated in the instructions. And it is important, otherwise it's one of the more common reasons we will have uh, weekly failures is, uh, is the phantom positioning problem. So how do I perform the ACR scan? Well, its basic acquisition consists of three series. One is a sagittal slice, single slice, and then there are 11 axial slices that are both T1 and T2 weighted. In the US actually, in addition to that, every year uh, the site has to submit both a T1 and a T2 uh, acquisition from their standard clinical scans on, on the ACR Phantom uh, as uh, from specifically their neuro protocol uh, in addition to the ACR standard protocol. In addition, uh, there are modules. So if your site wishes to do neuro, you have to submit uh, clinical neuro images. So not volunteers, actual patient data for neuro. If you want to be accredited for cardiac, you have to do this for cardiac. And it's required for that site to be accredited in those modules and essentially to bill Medicare uh, for exams involving that uh, specific module. The, the acquisitions are fairly straightforward and you can see the parameters below. Uh, we do tend to make sure that the receive bandwidth is 16 kilohertz or higher just so we don't have distortion from SHIM, which is not the goal uh, in this case. Those are separate studies. But you can see essentially the protocols are, are quite straightforward. So how do you perform it? Well, the single slice is automatic. You just uh, acquire it as it's, uh, as it's specified. The 11 slices, you actually have to place the slices such that the first and the 11th slices actually intersect these crossing uh, wedges you see in the top left and bottom left of the phantom on the, on the picture before you. If you're not level in the SI direction, the 11 slice positions you see uh, will not pass through the thin wedges uh, that you see in the top here. You can just faintly see uh, left to right, the lines that are actually slices uh, seven, eight, or eight, nine, ten, and eleven, where the the thin little circles are present. So you, if you don't have your phantom level, you won't be able to go both through the wedges and those slices. So it's very important to be level. You can use a non-magnetic level. Every site has one that's basically lives with the ACR phantom to achieve this. So how do I analyze it? Well, there are seven tests uh, to perform, uh, and we use both the one sagittal and the 11 axial slices from the T1 and T2 series to do these tests. The measurements are very tedious. They take about 20 minutes if you were to perform them manually on each data set. So there are commercial packages for automated analysis, which exist to allow faster and more accurate analysis. Uh, our site uh, has adopted a open source MATLAB package, uh, which I adapted from uh, this uh, online uh, project for QC to our local site. So it, it automatically automatically does the data collection, uh, analysis, and uh, archiving. Uh, it, it, it also offers an efficiency. So instead of 20 minutes, it takes only about three minutes for the QC techs to analyze each data set uh, and to populate an Excel sheet with trending diagrams uh, for how week-to-week -week variations are occurring for all kinds of measurements. So it requires no manual data entry. It's copy-paste, and it's a archive that satisfies the regulatory needs so that you can produce trending, for example, from transmit gain, analog digital gain, the magnet center frequency, all kinds of things are archived so you need to have manual data entry, which is prone to error. So what are these tests? I'll go through them one at a time. The first one, ACR test number one, is for geometric accuracy. Essentially, this measures the length or the apparent length of the phantoms in each of the three sort of directions. So you see in the top left, it actually uses an edge detection algorithm to measure the length of the phantom in the SI direction. It's known to be 148 millimeters, and you have to have accuracy within two millimeters. So that's the, the two vertical red lines you see. Uh, in addition, we measure how accurately the lasers are positioned. So that's the green 
pl uh, X sign you see on the phantom. It's supposed to be where the red X is on the sort of superior edge of that grid phantom. That's where you landmark on the on the little nose crosshair that's that's listed on the phantom. So you're supposed to have accuracy within about five millimeters for the lasers and within two millimeters for distortion in each of the directions. And you can see both the axial and the sagittal images are used for this. Now, why, might, why uh, is it that this test might fail? So gati uh, the gradient's gain may be wrong and the gain or how much Gauss per centimeter you get for a certain number of amps of current, that can actually change on MRI systems uh, as, we, as the amplifiers drift over time that can actually change the apparent field of view in your images if it's not compensated for. Um, and this is part of the preventive maintenance tests that a vendor will do. You can also have low received bandwidth where you're oversensitive to shim, or maybe you have strong B0 in homogeneity because the field homogeneity of your magnet or the shim is degrading over time. So these are all reasons, and you have to do further explorations to know which possible reason is the source of the failure of these tests. ACR test number two is the high contrast spatial resolution test. So it uses slice one. You can see this axial slice in the top on the left side there. It's essentially got little bored out holes that are separated uh, 1.1, 1.0, and 0 0.9 millimeters as you go from left to right as, uh, as illustrated in the, in the diagram. And essentially you have to be able to see, and you can see uh, the image to the right, uh, four coherent dots in one of the rows uh, as you go left to right on the top left little square and one of the one of the columns as you go up to bottom on the bottom right little square. So you have to be able to distinguish uh, clearly and you can in this case uh, in order for it to pass. So you can pass at 1.1, 1.0 or 0 0.9 with the criteria being uh, passing at 1.0. So why might this fail? There's a lot of reasons the resolution test can fail. You can have bad eddy current compensation or the fidelity of your gradients uh, due to a calibration going out of specification. You can have too much image filtering. Uh, sometimes what makes an image look good and smooth actually degrades the resolution. Um, so you can use this test to check for that. Sometimes the phantom moves, uh, which is often due to uh, lack of stability. So you might need more pads to stabilize it uh, during the scan. Uh, or you could have excessive phase encode ghosting. So there's some other reason why you have an instability in either your RF or gradient systems. Again, the test doesn't tell you which thing is wrong. It just flags that there's a problem. You have to do further tests to figure out what that problem is. Test number three is slice thickness accuracy. So again, in that first slice, you can see these two little lines left to right, which are basically slanted wedges at about 10 degree slope. So essentially the thickness, and you typically set up your protocols with a five millimeter slice thickness that should produce a five centimeter long slice uh, from left to right. So we measure it, we see if it's 50 millimeters and that would indicate that the actual slice thickness was correct at five millimeters. The specification for the ACR is that you have to be five millimeters plus or minus 0.7 millimeters in order to pass. So um, why might that fail? Well, you could have, essentially the most common thing is a problem with your RF amp and its linearity. So the actual RF pulses require good fidelity from the RF amp, and if that starts to fail, what we call RF amp droop over time, then you might have distorted pulses and poor profiles on your slice select. They're not nice, clean rectangles. Um, the other problem could be gradient calibration. So you may not have the gradient strength that's required to uh, target the required slice thickness. So either of those, again, you have to figure out what the real problem is. Just this flags that one of those things is, a, is at fault. Slice position accuracy uh, is where these two little lines you see at the top, they basically in slice one should be almost the same length. Uh, that's basically back to, did you put your 11 slices in the correct position? So assuming you did, these two lines should be the exact same length. The difference in the length tells you how much your slice position is inaccurate. Now, the number one reason that this fails uh, is from poor slice prescription. So basically, if you don't place the slices quite precisely enough at the wedges, or you don't have your phantom quite level enough, then this uh, slice position accuracy test can fail. Uh, it, it's basically a check to make sure that the position of the phantom was appropriate, such that the rest of the tests won't be failing because of poor uh, phantom positioning. It is possible that you did everything perfectly correct in positioning, but there is a strong off resonance or B0 homogeneity, uh, but that's unlikely. It's almost always slice positioning and it's a good check for that.
Uh, ACR test five is image intensity uniformity. So essentially the boring slice number seven, you want it to be a homogeneous flat field. Um, the percent image uniformity uh, should be greater than 87% for a one and a half T system or greater than 82% for a three T system. Uh, so for head coil arrays, uh, you use one of the image intensity flattening algorithms like Skick or Pure uh, to, um, to correct for the variation from coil element to coil element. So if you are using a head multi-channel coil, uh, you need that setting on in order to, to evaluate this. Um, and other problems though, could be that the phantom is not positioned. So usually if you have it uh, incorrect in the AP direction, um, you might have a uniformity breakdown. You can also have severe phase encode ghosting, again, due to a problem with your RF or gradient stability, or your phantom is, has got a lot of movement. It's vibrating and moving around during the scan. So you have to stabilize it. Uh, or you could have, in the case of a multi-element uh, head coil, a failure of some of the RF elements that is creating uh, essentially drop out in some part of the image. So these are all reasons the intensity uniformity test might fail. Test six, percent image ghosting. Essentially, um, the phase encode direction, which I think is left to right in this image, as opposed to the frequency encode direction up to down, you can evaluate if there's ghosting. So the ghosting should be less than two and a half percent. The reason for this failing is often um, the phantom is moving. So you fail to stabilize it with pads but it could also mean that there's a problem with gradient or RF stability problems. It is very rare for this test to fail. It's a very old test and most modern magnets can, uh, can even if there is an issue, uh, defeat it. So we've added, and I'll talk about it in a few moments, uh, additional stability checks uh, beyond signal percent signal ghosting to kind of evaluate uh, these kinds of stabilities. Uh, finally, ACR test number seven is the low contrast object detection test. So this is uh, slices uh, 8, 9, 10, and 11, which are, you can see the little circles in your top left uh, di uh, MRI image there, where you can see little thin wedges that have been cut out that are intended to show contrast. The hardest one is slice 8, where there's only 1.4% contrast. And then the thicker and thicker cutouts are up to slice 11, where you have 5.1% contrast. So what the uh, QC technologist does in windows and levels, uh, as you can see the window level uh, histogram, to try to count how many rungs. So they kind of count one through 10 to see how many of the rungs can they see all three circles. If they can get all the way to the 10th, the smallest little circles, then they score a 10. If you get all four slices scoring 10, then your score is 40. Your score has to be 37 for uh, 3T systems and uh, typically it's above 30 for one and a half T systems. The actual standard is quite low at nine, but typically if I don't see 30, it's usually indicative of a problem. And sometimes that problem is uh, phantom positioning. This test often fails if you don't have a level phantom with uh, the 11 slices correctly positioned. But there are other reasons it can fail beyond poor slice prescription. You can have low signal to noise ratio, uh, either in your uh, RF uh, receive chain or problem with your RF coil, or you can have excessive ghosting from problems in the RF or gradient stability. So what do we do with all of these measurements? So if you have a problem and you've identified what that might be, you have to do what I described as translating uh, from image artifact to system or vendor speak. So vendors typically operate and think about the various subsystems on an MR system as to what kind of problems may be occurring. They don't think phase encode ghosts or um, signal to noise ratio. They tend to think there's a problem with the gradient systems. And if there is, they have various tests. They can check for eddy current compensation, Cal. They can check for uh, amplifier gain drift in the gradient amps uh, or stability checks. There could be problems with the RF transmit system, the RF receive system, which could be RF coils or something in the receive chain. Or there could be a problem with the actual main static field itself. Is it homogeneous or shim? Or is it drifting? Uh, is it changing its center frequency over time? So it's useful when you've identified a problem with your QC program to offer some, some, some suggestions to the vendor as to where the issue may be uh, so that you can efficiently zero in on the problem. So there are additional tests I hinted at earlier that we do on modern scanners because the ACR standard is somewhat outdated in some of its measurements uh, for rigor. So um, particular modern applications that weren't around in the 90s uh, robustly like functional MRI and diffusion tensor imaging 
They have a particular premium on stability in the case of fMRI or gradient fidelity in the case of DTI. So we've added two tests in our uh, Nova Scotia program to further assess these. You've probably seen uh, the EPI stability tests. These are two minute dynamic EPI scans that are single shot so they can look distorted, but their goal is not to measure distortion, it's to look at stability. So we basically look at these images over two minutes and go looking to see if there's any variation over time. Then we also have a short six direction DTI scan where we essentially apply a B1000 gradient in six directions. And you can look to see if the slice actually shifts or translates over time, which is specific to eddy current compensation as a problem. So the first one, the stability test, uh, you can kind of see what the images look like. They look kind of distorted, but it's really a test of stability. What I'm looking for here is if there's any outlier. So I calculate an outlier probability. So sometimes you'll have an image, uh, one out of the 120, that's just bad. And this can happen for like a spurious sort of like an electrostatic discharge or some other problem. So it's very useful to look for the, the, the one outlier image because this can indicate when you may have an, uh, have an issue that's, that's transient rather than stable. So it's a non-specific gradient or RF stability problem, but it's a very sensitive version effectively of ACR test number six. Um, it can also fail if you don't have good stabilization of your phantom with pads. So that's another reason the EPI stability test can fail. The DTI calibration test, and you can see in the little movie on the left, uh, where it's cycling through the six directions with a B1000 gradient. You can see it dancing a little bit. It has both stretch, uh, so the, the field of view effectively on the phantom uh, is increasing or decreasing, and it can shift as the entire circle kind of moves left, right, up, or down. So we actually measure the RMS displacement of the stretch and the shift uh, to kind of evaluate whether or not our eddy current compensation may be going out of calibration. And that can happen as various temperature and other factors in your magnet change over time. So the weekly QC pro protocol you can actually find on your scanner. It's a total protocol, takes about 16 minutes. And you can see at the very end there, we have this bed reset scan where essentially you have to hit home and then return to scan. That basically checks to make sure your the patient table uh, motor assembly is sending the, the bed back to the exact same spot. Because as you know, clinically, it's often the case where you have to interact with the patient and then send them back, uh, where some of the series are from the first uh, positioning and some are from the second. It's very important to have the patient table go back to the same location within about a millimeter so that the radiologist can fuse or line up the various images because some some images like diffusion are are poor resolution and they have a lot of functional information and they really rely on the anatomic the t2 scans to assess what's going on so so this is one of the tests we've added in as a as a home advanced to scan and you can see the protocol and the instructions are are there to read uh, at your site uh, if you if you have any questions about how to run it so what do we do with this data? And you're seeing a snapshot effectively here of the data archiving and action triggers. Essentially, uh, measurements, any measurements are not relevant unless you actually act upon them. So what I do is I create essentially uh, uh, boundaries, uh, which are when a parameter goes out of specification, it will automatically color that as red. So red are highlighted automatically when deviation exceeds what I set the limits as. So the QC text basically uh, process the data and paste it in and automatically reds and yellows show up either as fails or as cautions in the case of yellow when it's when it's outside of a standard deviation. And that happens about 33% of the time. So it's just a, a flag to keep an eye on something in case it might be deviating. Um, so, so this is essential, essentially that the text, uh, the QC text make these measurements and they report what has failed, and then I decide what sort of actions are required uh, to deal with that. And we have such an Excel file, and you can see all the plots for all 10 magnets across uh, the province. They have, each have their own individual Excel file. So what kind of results do we, do we tend to have here? You can sort of see uh, some examples where we've got the 10 sort of magnets. This is about a year or so uh, ago before some of the newer magnets have been installed at the IWK and Sydney. But you can see essentially some of them have a particular outlier uh, for particularly poor, say, EPI signal stability or excessive uh, distortion. So, for example, the Valley's lasers were outside the five millimeter range. Uh, 
Uh, Yarmouth has a highest EPI outlier where you have essentially some white pixel artifact, which we have identified in GE's tests as well. And we and you basically it's a challenging thing to to overcome, but we work through that to improve that uh, that problem. Um, prior to the upgrades, both Sydney and the Halifax 3T have non-zero field drift. This was a problem in Sydney. It's not a problem for various technical reasons in the Halifax 3T site, but it's useful to see these things and have them flagged so that we know if there are issues and, and what we need to do with these. So essentially moving on to from the previous tests, which are done weekly across the province to tests that are done once a year or the annual physicist checks, they essentially fall into multiple categories, but two of the main ones are multi-channel RF coil checks and also magnetic field homogeneity checks. So it, it is the situation that the RF coils are actually not a part of the quarter PM checks. So whether or not there are problems or any dead elements in any of the multi-channel receive coils, you, you would only previously know this as if there was a uh, hospital initiated uh, complaint to the vendor. So when I first adopted this policy at the VG and the HI sites, um, after these had been in service for more than five years, I, I discovered that about four of the 14 coils, for example, at the VG were actually failing multi-channel coil checks. Now, it's not always as obvious that this has happened clinically as you would think, because there's these skick and pure intensity correction algorithms that essentially scale up weak areas of your coil uh, but the problem is, although it doesn't look like it's dark and obviously failing, it makes it very snowy in that area. So it, it can hide subtle pathologies um, if you allow this to kind of persist. So these coil checks, they essentially, they have every phantom with a very precise setup with a very uh, particular set of phantoms where you have to make the measurements and essentially get pass fails and you can evaluate. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that in the next few slides. The other major activity uh, is to check essentially the magnetic fields homogeneity. These are performed annually by the vendor. So I can review them to assess their accuracy and whether or not there's any issues that need to be taken up. So what is an RF coil check? As I mentioned, it's a precise arrangement for each multi-channel coil where you put precise phantoms uh, that are custom made by the vendor for this exact uh, particular purpose. So you can see the familiar uh, HNS uh, with chest part set up on your right. So you can see the cylindrical phantom that's in the head portion and there's a, uh, a brick that's essentially under the chest part. So you set this up and then you effectively uh, access the tools from the service desktop that perform these coil checks. And these can be run by the customer, they can be run by the sites if you know how to set up the phantoms. And then you just simply sit start. So what does it look like when you run this? So an RF coil check looks something like this. You see in this case uh, for the HNS channel coil, uh, there are 14 images. These are not different positions. This is the same slice where a single element has been turned on and an image made uh, for each of the 14 elements. So normally you only see the sum of squares when you see a reconstructed image from this coil. But in this case, they make the images for every single element. And you can see on the right, uh, the output from the coil check. Essentially, red is the required signal to noise for each of the elements and black is what you actually measured. So brand new coils typically have each element have about twice the signal to noise ratio of the failure threshold. So we can kind of look and we tend to look to see are there any weak elements where the SNR is dropping or is there any high noise channels. So coils often fail with one of those two scenarios uh, and it's often a, a, a preamp. Uh, a small component that's in these RF coils that is the, the cause of the problem. So the province-wide RF coil check results, as I said, when I first started doing this, um, there were 10 MRIs with 89 coils, 121 configurations, and overall there was a 12% failure rate. There was, a, there was a strong difference between what was happening in city and rural, where we had essentially a 24% coil failure rate in the city and a much lower approximate 4% failure rate in rural sites. Uh, in year two, this has improved and the city is down to a more uh, manageable 9% failure rate. So it's much higher um, in the city, or at least it was. Uh, I think this is probably a function of having multiple technologists rot through, rotate through multiple sites. So there tends to be less of a single pair of eyes uh, 
seeing a pair, a single problem. So the division of responsibility problem where problems persist and everybody thinks someone else is looking after it. So, so I think um, annual QC really helps in that area, but it's certainly, we are finding coils that fail in the rural sites as well. So it's important to do this to make sure you don't have that problem. So that's the QC program. I just want to touch briefly at the end on protocoling. Now, I always laugh at this joke from Dr. Matthias Schmidt. He's a, he's a very, very wise uh, neuroradiologist in the, in the central zone. He, he said to me once, and it stuck with me, if you want six opinions, just ask five neuroradiologists. And, and I, I really, that has stuck with me as if we've, have we've begun essentially trying to, to uh, coordinate and get a little more structure around how we do protocoling uh, in the central zone for, for our various protocols. So what we've done is we've uh, created essentially protocoling uh, committees. And then protocoling has two important components. First of all, the radiologists, they tend to, uh, for each clinical indication, uh, IAC or routine brain, they specify just like what kind of series or contrast they want, like 3D axial T2 or pre and post contrast. But uh, protocoling to the technologist means something slightly different. It's like for each series, what are the scan parameters to optimize the quality of the image? Uh, do I have the right acceleration factor? Is my TE and TR appropriate? Uh, is the matrix size right? Have I gone for too much resolution, too little? Well, are there other types of sequences? Do I use FSC or propeller if I've got a patient that's moving? Positioning, breath hold instructions. All of this is what protocoling means to a technologist. So we try to control this process. Uh, and I, I try to indicate that protocoling is essentially a process. It's not a one and done. You get your scanner, you get your protocols and check back 10 years later. Whenever you, there's constantly evolving new acquisition software, changes in coils and changes in, in actually clinical practice that drive changes in protocols. And you need an active program to, to fully absorb and adjust to these changes. So it is the hope that we converge on optimized and consistent protocols and that we can create the benefit of image quality uh, that will re reduce the need for repeat exams for the various sites. Um, uh, and, and then basically in response to local preferences. So these committees uh, that we've kind of created in the central zone, uh, they each have essentially for each section, say body or MSK or neuro, there's a lead tech and paired with a lead radiologist. So they work together. The technologist coordinates with the RADs to prioritize which protocols are struggling the most or whether there's the most, uh, most, most complaints. Um, so each magnet in the central zone has one day a month that's booked. Um, and about three weeks pr uh, prior to that, we'll decide what it is we want to run. So maybe we want to work on uh, like a shoulder uh, MSK protocol. So it, what we do is we measure the standard clinical series plus some competitive alternative series that we believe may uh, improve the situation, which we often call an alpha scan. We just have some protocols we think might work and we try it to see if it looks better. If we see something that we think is promising, then we move to what I've kind of described as beta. We try to have a number of patients, say six, using that exact protocol. Because as you know, it's often a frequent mistake when protocoling to test it on your friends, another technologist who's good at lying still and knows how to behave in the scanner. And the moment you go to a patient who are less cooperative and they have movement, um, you, you have terrible images. And it's often the case when you optimize with too much resolution for a compliant person, uh, that a patient who moves more has terrible images. So that, that's a common mistake if you don't actually protocol with real patients. So this, this is uh, how it works. It's led by the technologists in partnership with the radiologist they're partnered with. And the MR physicist, uh, me, I'm essentially a resource to the text to identify what might be good parameters uh, to try to improve a, a struggle protocol. And this is sort of like, uh, for example, our neural protocols are managed by uh, Rebecca Jessam and Dr. Bob Van Dorp. So she, uh, this is an example of the spreadsheet she keeps where she sort of documents what are the protocols, what are the problems, what are the things we did about it, what are the results that we found from that. So I guess just in summary, uh, the ACR requires both weekly and annual measurements to be performed in order to have uh, accreditation. So this documentation should be uh, electronic and it's best accomplished automatically with clear visible action triggers so that you know if you're acceptable or not. So quality comes from many stages, including procurement, protocol, and QC, and reporting. It's not always wet vendor and QC failure. It's often protocoling. It's useful to speak the language of vendors when you're identifying a problem. So is it gradients, RF, main field? Um, whereas the 
hospital QC texts are more in the image artifact realm. So it's useful to, to understand how to translate the systems terminology so that the vendors uh, can provide timely service. So it's also useful to use the vendor test when possible. If you get a, something that you think is failing, like an RF coil check, and you show to, for example, GE, that even with the GE RF coil check, it's failing, you're most likely to get responsiveness more than if you have a homemade test where they have to evaluate whether they agree with your test. So if you fail it with their tests, that's a great way to get uh, service. So thank you. Uh, I'll just provide my contact information, uh, which you can see there. And uh, if you have any questions, since this is a virtual presentation, uh, more than happy to receive emails. Thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you. Bye-bye.